Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Wow. Okay. Know. On today's show, an exhausted Donald Trump is talking dicks and flipping burgers as both campaigns race to get those last remaining undecided voters off the fence. I'd much rather be talking burgers and flipping dicks. <laughs> Oh, you high-fived on that. <laughs> okay. I didn't even know that was coming. <laughs> like to surprise you guys. Kamala Harris continues her sprint through the battlegrounds with help from Barack Obama, Liz Cheney, and many others, while the world's richest man launches a legally questionable million-dollar sweepstakes to help Trump. And later, friend of the pod, Hawaii Senator Brian Schatz, talks to Lovett about how the race is looking and the most important things everyone can do to help. But first... Donald Trump may very well win this race, but uh, with two weeks to go, he seems to be losing steam and his mind. A Trump advisor reportedly told an outlet that their 78-year-old candidate has been canceling interviews because he's, quote, exhausted. A recent Associated Press headline reads, A failed mic leaves Donald Trump pacing the stage in silence for nearly 20 minutes in Detroit. (laughs) This was after he stopped taking questions at a Pennsylvania town hall so he could uh, rock out to Ave Maria and YMCA for a good half hour or so. Uh, And whenever Trump does speak, his rhetoric lurches from uh, deranged to absurd. Uh, Here he is with Fox News' Howie Kurtz over the weekend. The other day you called it a day of love. That sparked a lot of reaction. Can you understand why many Americans would view it as a dark and tragic day in our history? The crowd I spoke before, which you rarely see, I have pictures of it, massive, but nobody wants to put them in. It was the biggest crowd I've ever spoken to, and I've spoken to the biggest crowds. I've never seen that many people. Mm -hmm. I tell you, there was a beauty to it, and there was a love to it that I've never seen before. Uh, The enemy within is a pretty ominous phrase if you're talking about other Americans. I think it's accurate. I mean, I think it's accurate. After our interview, Donald Trump flew to Pennsylvania, Arnold Palmer's hotel, where he discussed the golfer's cyberness of his manhood. This is a guy that was all man. This man was strong and tough, and I refuse to say it, but when he took showers with the other pros, they came out of there, they said, oh my God, that's unbelievable. (laughs) I had to say it. He had to say it. Uh, Why do you guys think he felt the need to tell the crowd that the late Arnold Palmer was hung like a one would? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. There's a lot to talk about in that whole package. A lot to talk about. Package. Why? Uh, there yeah, you go. Say. First yeah. of all, why did Howie Kurtz have like a four packs a day voice in the interview and then he sounded normal after? What was going on there? So, the, I, I, I was. That. This is neither here nor there, but also, Howie Kurtz, he looked like he was from the 70s. It was like a, not in a good or bad way, but like his haircut looked like he was like this reporting on the oil embargo during the Carter <laughs> era. It was a deeply weird interview mm. uh, do you shower together after you golf this was one of my first questions like i'm not a i'm not a golfer but it doesn't seem like a shower afterwards type of sport yeah ben dreyfus did some original reporting i on was this. gonna say <laughs> did you guys see this? I, I didn't Tommy, i was gonna bring it up and then i was like i don't know how to explain ben's reporting well, in a way that is i don't want to scoop him appropriate I just think it's cool even that for of, this podcast of the three of us i'm not the one that went deeper into whether or not Arnold palmer had a giant dick deep <laughs> on the dong <laughs> ben dreyfus story. did ben dreyfus did and Seems uh, like he. I, I, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that he does not necessarily have a big dick. Had circum. Sorry. Rest in peace. <laughs> Is he? Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. <laughs> he's dead. Yeah, he died in 2016. Yeah, they had a they had to push that lid down on the coffin pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, shit. <laughs> This wow. is what this, is what this yeah, campaign has done to us. There's nothing left to talk <laughs> um, about except for this dead drivers, <laughs> but junk, this is this dead is, golfers junk. This is the point too. Like it, we're skipping over how in the interview he was like, "Oh yeah, I do think that the uh, violent attack on the Capitol was a day of love, and and I do think the Democrats are the enemy within." Which again, we we predicted this would happen. I think this this was like right after Mike Johnson speaking of Johnson's, went on um, Meet the Press or somewhere and was asked about this. And he's like, oh, that's not what he meant. That's not what he meant. And sure enough, it's like, yes, Donald I Trump's like, this is exactly what I meant. Punish Adam Schiff. That's Glenn, what I meant. Whatever Glenn Youngkin said, whatever Mike Johnson said, whatever anyone else is saying to try to defend me that I, I didn't, this is exactly what I mean. Yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's, if Trump were on a unicycle saying I'm going to imprison my enemies, it's still dangerous, even though it's pretty funny that he's on a unicycle. So, yeah. <laughs> A deranged clown can be funny, but like you know, you give him uh, you give him the nukes. Not so funny. No. Um, 
In general, how do you guys think the uh, let Trump be Trump strategy is playing out in the final weeks here? Net positive, net negative? I think on balance, it's a net negative. Uh, <laughs> 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 like it seems, it's hard to argue that if you were just, have, you know, had like a disciplined message about the economy for the remainder of campaign, that that would, that would probably help him. Uh, calling January 6th a day of love absolutely unequivocally hurts him and repeating it on how he hurts hurts him um i think the arnold palmer stuff like look there's a lot of young men in particular who hear this and just think it's funny they think it's trump is authentic he's he's goofy he doesn't care about being politically correct or saying the right thing like the head spinning part about this is always that he wins evangelical voters like 95 to 1 and you would think that the kind of mike pences of the world or the people who would find this offensive in some way or you know the people get mad about like a, a disney character not being white every few years just thought I'd kind of brush this stuff off. Look, there's a little bit of politics in him talking about Arnold Palmer having a, a big dick, which is like he was a real man. He was there. Were, there used to be real men in this mm. country. We celebrate real masculine men, with, and the other with, side with doesn't. Big dicks, big swinging golf. dicks, <laughs> big big golfing. A bunch dicks. of guys in the shower, just yeah. <laughs> even I'm uncomfortable. He doesn't with even how need clubs. This Arnold Palmer guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's just out there with a putter, fucking buck ass naked, golfing. Let me tell you about the only pole that matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just think, like, look, it doesn't matter how. Look, any great golfer will tell you, uh, oh, you don't need are. a. You, you nope. can you can have a heavier club. You can have a lighter nope. club. It's about nope. touch. It's, a, it's about finesse. I was gonna say. I was waiting for Tommy <laughs> to make the motion and the. I beat him to it. <laughs> I beat about him to a short it. game. Hey. <laughs> Continue. What hey. else were you going to talk about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look. What else were we going to talk about, John? <laughs> I don't know. I think you can say in these final weeks he is not driving much of a message himself. No, we can separate him rounds. from the campaign, of course. His campaign is running all kinds of ads. They are driving a very specific message. Uh, he is not driving much of one. There was also a Time story. I don't know if you guys saw this last week, about how he's just over the weekend, how he's just bored of the economy. That's why he's making it all about immigration. Like when he does drive a message, it's almost exclusively about immigration because he thinks the crowd doesn't get that much. The crowd seems bored by, yeah. which I think is very revealing. It's, the what, the, it's what the crowd likes and it's what he likes. He's yeah. like genuinely passionate about it. I, I think like with Trump, the medium is the message. Uh, I think when he's ranting and raving in front of his biggest fans, I think his biggest fans like it when it gets outside of that. I think it, it hurts him. I think the kind of, uh, goofy, rambling, occasionally funny Trump in a podcast setting. Uh, I think they think it's better for him than than sitting down for mainstream interviews. I don't think it's as helpful as their campaign would want it to be because he is so um, he's just he's just lost a step. So even when he's doing his greatest hits, he's just not bringing the same energy to it. He doesn't have many more steps to lose at this point. No, he's almost no. out of steps. Have you seen these clips of uh, Frankie Valley? No, Frankie Valley yes. has a Vegas show. It's quite, I sad. believe, and basically, he kind of they kind of wheel out and ninety some odd year old Frankie Valley, and he kind of holds the mic up here, and then they just play his greatest hits. <laughs> and increasingly, that's what Trump is like. They kind of get him out there, and he's like, "We used to be tough in this country." I think the Jews might be responsible. It's like, and it's a little bit like he's a random number generator and just like some part of the Trump kind of the Trump light, the Trump large language model will kind of spit something out. There is, there's a bit of, uh, you'll be surprised to learn. There's a bit of hyperbole that like whenever Trump says something crazy now, every, they try to like put everything in the dementia frame, right? Yeah. He's lost it. Like the Arnold Palmer thing is, I don't think no. it's not that, even though some some people were treating it like that. He didn't tell it as well as he would have five years ago. Right. He would have been more charming and funny about it a couple years ago. Right, right. But I do think when you combine the like the weird swaying to YMCA and Ave Maria at that town hall with the 20 minutes of walking around in silence while he's waiting for a mic. Also, no one could get him a mic in 20 minutes. It's that inexplicable. Seems, that seems great. Inexplicable you don't have another mic. And, and just like... The rallies, the rambling, the speeches are going on for even longer than usual, and they've always been really long. It, it, if Again, if you watch a rally or an interview with a MAGA-friendly uh, outlet, which is the only ones he does now, I think you will not be impressed with Donald Trump. <laughs> and you're right, the podcast ones, maybe maybe some people are impressed with that, some of the podcast ones, some podcast interviews, but I don't know. Now, the irony is he only does stuff in his safe space. He's on like kind of podcasts with former wrestlers like The Undertaker or kind of Barstool Sports type. Uh, shows or Fox kind of friendly audiences, but he does better when he's pressed a little bit. When he did the thing with John Micklethwaite, the editor of Bloomberg News, 
they got into a back and forth and Trump was pissed. He was punching back and he got aggressive and it made him a little more disciplined. And also he was getting cut off by Micklethwaite. So he couldn't go on. He couldn't do the weave for 35 minutes about some bizarre story that ends with, you know, the the golden bear's ass is kind of like the punchline. It's like he, he, he gets forced to be a little more focused and like pugilistic. And I think when he's on, when he's just like alone at a mic, he ends up in going on these diatribes that hurt him. Yeah. Uh, Two of Trump's comms people did an interview with uh, Semaphore uh, where they said that the freewheeling Trump is a strategic choice to counteract the Harris campaign's portrayal of him. Um, and basically they said that, you know, if, if voters see Trump laughing and joking, I've never seen him laugh, um, they know he can't possibly be uh, a threat to democracy. Do you, do you agree with that general idea? I agree that that's what they're trying to do. And I think there's some validity to it. Mm. I do think that if the only thing people saw was was Trump j laughing it up at a McDonald's or having a funny moment on a podcast with Theo Vaughn about Coke, and then what they see on television is Liz Cheney being like, he will end democracy. I, I think that that's a, that is their fair pushback, but it's not enough. It doesn't counteract the other many clips of him actually issuing the threats and doing all of the rest. Yeah, I think we're kind of, we're trying to retrofit uh, reality into a strategy here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think the thing that prevents people from thinking that he is some scary authoritarian threat to democracy is his four years in office and the fact that he's like the best known celebrity on the planet. I've sure these interviews help him goofing around, being fun and talking about like, you know, the guy who took over for Lou Gehrig. That all helps Wally Pip. But yeah, I mean, these guys are trying to make it sound like they have some sort of strategic genius here when it's just their guy doing Trump jazz. I thought what was most revealing about that is that they are concerned that he appears as a threat to democracy <laughs> and they know that that is not um, that is not politically helpful to him. And so that they are trying this in the first place. Agree with you guys that uh, they're not quite succeeding. Well, yeah, I just think that, like, there are two campaigns running like Donald Trump is a, is a is not strategic, but he has smart people around him. Everything they do isn't going to be stupid. Trump is going to get wins on the board. He's going to have effective moments. He's going to have charming moments. I think I think to Tommy's point, yeah, they're trying to the, turn the fact that they can't really figure out what to do with him at a rally to stop him from f going off script for an hour and a half. They're trying to turn that into an advantage. But like there were I was when I, when, when reading that interview, I was like, well, this is pretty smart. Now, you then remember, wait, the person they're describing is Donald Trump. No, he's not having this incredibly successful interview on these platforms. He's not do delivering what they're claiming he's delivering. But there's a part of that interview where they talk about why they prefer going to comedians and others than going to uh, national media that a member of the Kamala Harris could, campaign yeah. could absolutely say that like less charged and toxic For conversations. Sure. And I'm yeah. like, well, that's smart. That's right. Yeah, they're just describing like, the reality of the current media landscape. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Trump event that got the most attention this weekend was uh, the big visit to McDonald's in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, basically, the Trump campaign shut down a McDonald's temporarily, then picked some people to go through the drive through so Trump could serve them fries and repeat the weird lie he keeps telling that Kamala Harris never worked at McDonald's. Just no basis in that at all. Um, obviously... This drove everyone a little crazy. The one CBS reporter did ask Trump a substantive question about the minimum wage. Uh, let's listen. Well, I think this. I think these people who work hard, they're great. And I just saw something, a process that's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to see. These are great franchises and produce a lot of jobs. And it's great. And great people work in here, too. But what minimum wage is so much more. Really good people. Increase. So, yes, ma'am. So take that as a no. Maybe. <laughs> yes. Um, this whole stunt photo op event, whatever you want to call it, uh, generated quite a bit of attention and blowback. What'd you guys think? Uh, so first, you got McDonald's this morning. I did get McDonald's <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it I was did make, so it made angry. Me want McDonald's I was so we're mad. Talking about McDonald's. Advertising works. Branding uh, works. Yeah, I mean, it definitely made me want McDonald's more. I mean, look, I think <laughs> I think Donald Trump putting on and taking off an apron for the first time in his life at a closed McDonald's while he pretends to serve food to super fans uh, recruited, I suppose, by either the campaign or the MAGA owner of this franchise, like. It's a good picture. I think it's a good picture for Donald Trump. But I think we have to like just like I, I, it's so hard to get out of the like he's in an ape like all the kind of like joking and, and making it about the picture and not about the fact that like, of course, he doesn't support 
raising the minimum wage. Like Donald Trump would be a disaster for people who work at McDonald's. It is a sick fucking joke that he's putting on this apron. Last time he was president, he uh, tried to take away health care of millions of people. Uh, many of them probably worked at McDonald's. Uh, he will. He's opposed to their abilities. To he is opposed to their ability to unionize. He will take away their basic health care protections. Doesn't want to pay overtime. He will cut taxes for billionaires and corporations and make a national sales tax that regular people will have to pay to cover the difference. Like it's just, it's the whole, the idea that he is this candidate of the working man because he's put on a fucking apron. Like I think it's a good picture for him, but it's like our job to kind of not fall into the trap of debating him being at the McDonald's and like getting back to this, like make the picture a fucking a joke. Yeah, it was a really smart event. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really, really smart of them to do I, I don't know why he's obsessed with saying Kamala didn't work at, at McDonald's. Um, it, I guess he just lets her call her inauthentic or something. But uh, yeah, he got to raise that there. He, I mean, like it seemed fun and funny, normal, the whole event. I mean, I watched the whole thing. It was like 25, 26 minutes of him learning to use the fry machine, doing it in a suit and tie, which looks ridiculous. But I don't know. It, like he, he's authentically a fan of McDonald's. He eats it. He served it to athletes who won national championships. It was obviously a campaign stunt. It was not. He didn't really work the fryer like he dunked it once like in 07 remember obama did the seiu walk a day in their shoes event mm. with that woman pauline beck where he like got up at the crack of dawn and went work. with her they they made uh breakfast for this man she was a home health care worker she made breakfast for the man he swept up like it was an actual day of work with the seiu um that was different this was just a 25 minute stunt but it 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 went super viral on social media like we're all talking about it i think it was very smart yeah, I think it's, I think it's like a net neutral. I think there's like a ton of people making fun of it. A ton of people saying it's the best thing ever. I, I, I can't imagine it's it's moving many people. I think it's, I think, but look, there are a bunch of people who maybe don't read about it, but just see the picture and might be like, oh, cool. That's like the it's vast like, majority of people. Cool people. Cool. Vast majority of people will see a clip on their TikTok or social media or something and be like, oh, there's Donald Trump at like, McDonald's. It's kind of fun and different. Well, it broke it broke through to like. You know, people in my life that don't pay attention to much to politics, and I, I got some text by people who were just like, "What the fuck is this?" It wasn't like cool. It was like, "What the fuck is this?" Uh, yeah, I, I just think that like the 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 Trump people liking it. I just think it's a great picture. It's a great picture, and then people making fun of it because it's like, oh, he's like the it's like the worst undercover boss, like all those kind of jokes. I just I like I do think you have to kind of get to like this is somebody pretending to care about working class people. Right, that's what, And yeah. he will not. And like, it has to just be very, like, I, not jokey. I think the responses that that drove me uh, most insane are, uh, this is just like Dukakis in a tank. It's like, no, it's not. That. No, it's not. Oh, that was one of the popular liberal responses on Twitter. Yeah, most people are stupid. Uh, another one, good neighbor. another one was, deal with it. Face oh, it. by the way, I did some investigative reporting and that McDonald's got fined for health violations. <laughs> that I thought was kind of funny. I will not. You know <laughs> what, though? Like, what? I'm sorry. I like that. I'm sorry. But McDonald's serves millions of people every day. Nobody gets fucking sick. It's amazing. Nobody gets sick? It's amazing. No, nobody. Very rarely. Very, very rarely. Hmm. Obviously, the Kamala Harris campaign would do this, but they were showing some of the responses on TikTok, which I do think were very funny. It's just some like young kids being like, hey, Grandpa, just put the fries in the fucking bag. <laughs> well, well, the best part of this, he was obsessed with the fact that you didn't actually have to touch the fries to get them from the fryer to the container before the packaging to the packaging. And I was like, what did yeah. you think happened at a restaurant? Do you think people were hand scooping your fries? Well, and he was he was doing a basket? very Trump thing, which was just like talking a lot about how this and that. And the other thing, when like the people are just sitting there, like waiting, the, the, the people who've been hand selected by the campaign are just waiting there for their fries in their bag so they can drive off set. But then he yeah. did a little press conference from the takeout window, so he was taking questions from the press. And that, the image that was him. Was so good, it, it was, was good. It was, it was good. It was, well it was good. It looked like he looked good. He looked good in the apron. Let's just face it. It kind of reminded me of uh, when John Amos was in uh, coming coming to America and running the McDowells. If he wins, the picture of him uh, smiling and handing out fries is going to be the picture. If he loses, the picture of him sitting behind the window like this, <laughs> which was another one, that will be the picture. Uh, so it really the picture just will be him at like MSG or him in Coachella being like, why are you in California? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Uh, here's one response to the whole uh, McDonald's thing from a, uh, from a Democrat that I did find compelling. You've got Donald Trump putting on a little McDonald's costume because he thinks that's what people do. They're not trying to empathize with us. They are making fun of us. They are making fun of us. Donald Trump thinks that people who work at McDonald's are a joke. 
Elon Musk thinks that dangling money in front of a working person is a cute thing to do when the election of our lives is before us. Because that's what people and billionaires like that do. That was AOC, of course. I liked that because I think it turns it into a real populist argument and sort of exposes the fraud without yeah. being like, yeah. <laughs> No, I think which, that's right. Which that was my scientific term for what I thought most of the responses were like. Nyeh. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the world's richest man, Elon's now running a sweepstakes in Pennsylvania where he gives a million dollars a day uh, to someone who signed his super PACs petition, which is supporting just you sign a petition saying you support the First and Second Amendment. Uh, the only requirement, of course, is that you live in Pennsylvania uh, or in one of the other swing states and are registered to vote. Um, he's already given away at least two checks. Uh, but if you Google how to sign up, all the top results are articles examining whether this is legal. Tommy, have you read some of those articles? And uh, can you tell us if it is, in fact, legal? Tommy's read an article. He's here to tell us what he found. <laughs> <laughs> much like Elon, I skimmed much, a couple. <laughs> much, like, much like Donald Trump learning the fr fry later for the first time. <laughs> hey, here we are. Can we find it's law? So the law specifically says you cannot pay or offer to pay someone to register to vote or to vote. And those who do so can be fined up to $10,000 or get five years in jail or both. Because basically, we don't want the election turning into a bunch of billionaires paying the most people to vote. Obviously. Well, some of us don't want some that. Some of us don't. <laughs> Furthermore, the Department of Justice clarifies in its guidelines uh, about prosecuting election offenses that bribes include lottery chances or sweepstakes. So making this sort of a, a sweepstakes for Elon does not a get out of jail free card. So some election law experts think that this gambit from Elon is clearly illegal um, the must defenders will say, no, he's just offering a reward to people who sign his petition. He's not encouraging you to register to vote. But as you noted, John, to be eligible, you have to be registered to vote or live in one of these seven swing states. And the deadline for entering the contest just happens to be the deadline to register to vote in Michigan or Pennsylvania. So it's it's not subtle. It's just it's very clearly just designed and, and you know, talked about in concert with a bunch of messages about registering or voting early. With all election law things, you can find experts who say it's illegal. You can find those who say it's not. Big picture, I think Elon is betting that no one will enforce it. Yeah. Uh, that if they Just do, good bet when you look at the history of the FEC, Trump-friendly judges will probably get your back because they're greenlighting all kinds of uh, campaign spending these days. And if Trump gets elected, uh, obviously he will just okay. never yeah. ever <laughs> prosecute Elon Musk. <laughs> Down the list of pardons for him. Yeah, so I know Jamie Raskin talks about this in some more detail in today's What A Day newsletter, so check that out. But, you know, I think the bigger picture is like, what are the politics of this? Will people think it's gross? I kind of do. It, it, gross or just like, oh, you got to uh, you got to pay people to vote for Trump? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is that I mean, what, it that feels like now? it does not. I think Americans might inherently be offended by paying people off to vote. Well, that's why I re that's actually the part about the AOC clip that I liked even more than Me McDonald's too. part is just like, oh, this billionaire is going to dangle a million dollars in front of the plebes to see if you'll vote for. It. You know, it's yeah, just like that, such a. That said, if I were I'll just say that if I were a registered voter in any of the swing states that were eligible, I would, of course, sign this pledge. Everybody listening, if you feel like you could sign this pledge, I would consider doing it because uh, you can do a lot more with a million dollars than Elon Musk can. And uh, yeah, no, the the I'll, what honestly it reminded me of is um, there's like old footage and photographs of like Belgian and British uh, colonists like throwing coins and candies at the children in their colonies and that's what Elon going out there and like dangling in money in front of people like genuinely reminded me of yeah it's I don't think it's very I don't, it's I also, too cute I also don't think it's very effective just from a like yeah you can sign the if you're a registered voter or you register to vote this still doesn't mean you're gonna go vote <laughs> no. And the suggestion is like, okay, well, it's a First Amendment, Second Amendment petition. So you're only going to get Republicans and then you're going to have their contact info. And then, you know, Elon can get them with messaging and actually turn them out. It's like, no, you're just having a bunch of people who want money. So they'll pretend to care about the First and Second Amendment and sign your dumb little petition. And again, you don't have to take our, t you don't have to take our word for it. Uh, a lot of, the they interviewed some Trump campaign officials about this, who were, of course, all in background about Elon and the ground game and everything. And to a person, they were all just like, yeah, he's got his own thing. We've got our other things and he's just <laughs> doing it. We're, we're happy to have him out here, but uh, sounds like they. But this know. is like, <laughs> I feel like this is the Honorable Palmer's dick of the, mm. of the Elon shit, which is like, no, it's not the million dollar <laughs> pledge. It'll make sense in a second. It's the, <laughs> Tens of he's millions. Doing, he's doing the weave. He's gonna. I'm doing the weave, baby. Weave. I've been weaving. I listen. <laughs> Do you think Trump invented the weave? 
<laughs> guys been weaving dicks forever. Yeah, hundred. The, it's the hundreds of millions of dollars being dropped on the race by Elon, by the crypto bros, buying ads. Like this really is now like in the home stretch. There are these like there's like the there's the Kamala Harris campaign, and then there's the kind of twisted, bizarro, evil version, right? Like. The Kamala Harris campaign has raised a billion dollars. Trump has Elon's money and all of this crypto money and all this billionaire money from Ken Griffin and others. There is a real field organization. There's their paid for field organization, which uh, I really hope is is working about as well uh, as uh, you would expect an Elon turned on field organization in the last weeks of this campaign. Yeah. Then you have a, a turn out the vote operation versus a uh uh, undermine and scare the vote operation. Like there are these two things sitting side by side, and Elon is a big part of that. Uh, last thing before we get to Kamala Harris, um, we mentioned already the Democrats have uh, different theories of the case about how to attack Trump and company. Um, we haven't they talked about uh, our former boss, who is uh, Barack Obama, who's been having a really good time on the campaign trail, uh, just tearing into Trump. Uh, let's listen to how he did it uh, recently. You you would be worried. <laughs> if your grandpa started acting like this, you would. I mean, yeah, right? You'd like call up your brother, your cousin or something and be like, hey, have you seen grandpa lately? What are we going to do? But this is coming from somebody who wants unchecked power. Wants the most powerful office on earth with the nuclear codes and all that. Now, the point is, we, don't, we, we do not need to see what an older, loonier Donald Trump looks like with no guardrails. America's ready to turn the page. Speaking of people who like dick jokes, yeah. speeches. <laughs> yeah. um, that's basically another version of the uh, unserious, uh, unserious man, serious consequences that Kamala Harris has used. I don't know. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I think threats to democracy can sound a little vague and hard to understand in practice. I think don't give kooky grandpa the nukes. Like, that's that's not complicated. Yeah, the, the you only— You can see that one. Yes, I think that, that that was great. And it was much. It was actually much more, um, I think, mad. Like, there's—it's basically just, like, Donald Trump would be a mad king. Sometimes we talk more about the mad. Sometimes we talk more about the king. And, like, that was, I think, more mad-focused. But you saw a little little of the kind of the, the threat to democracy rhetoric with the phrase guardrails— with no guardrails, it's very like kind of threat to democracy. Mm. It's, it's, it's I just like the word guardrails just because it uh, you can conjure up a picture at least, as opposed to some of these words that uh, that the democracy defenders use. Yeah, no, for <laughs> like sure. Everyone knows what a guardrail is. No, I, I I I agree with that, but I think like the argument that like Donald Trump is just a, a like he's losing it, and you just don't want somebody who's losing it as president. You don't really need the other part of the argument that like oh he Mike Pence doesn't support him, he's going to have a different group of people around him. That is a different argument. I I thought it was like I think that's a, I, I well I think that second part is a very effective argument. I, I agree. I think, I think the big obstacle here, the, the big hurdle you've got to overcome is what Tommy pointed out, which is everyone's like oh yeah we survived the first Trump term, and they, I think what you have to the argument you have to make is yeah 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 that's fine and maybe you haven't tuned in since then but this would be much different because he's fucking crazy this has to be new information he's crazier and the people around him that were like somewhat normal are all gone and the people that are there your laura loomers your mike flynn's all these people they are fucking the bottom of the barrel i, I completely agree all that with all that i just think that like barack obama even at his most like he's we're all struggling to make this to tell this story that's connecting the fact that he's a kind of a, a, a doofus who's losing a step and wandering around the stage and not totally control of his faculties from the <laughs> authoritarian strongman that's coming towards us. I think both are part of the story and we're all figuring out different ways to talk about them. I think that that guardrails thing is just like, that's a larger argument that, that we don't see there, but I, I get it. Yeah. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. Whether you're planning to catch a football game or a Harris Walls rally this weekend, Simply Safe provides peace of mind by keeping your home secure. Simply Safe's Active Guard Outdoor Protection changes the game by actively monitoring and intervening against potential threats. This way, you can fully enjoy the event, knowing Simply Safe's agents have your back. It's really the best kind of zone defense. <laughs> Simply Safe. Really bummer if you come home from your Harris Walls event and uh, your house has been broken. Your house is playing man to man. That's why you need Simply Safe. That's, That's why right. Lovett has Simply Safe. He installed it himself. Somehow. Somehow. We don't have Not if the he most can install it, savvy you can person. certainly install it. You can do it. Old school home security systems only take action once someone is already inside your home. Simply Safe Home Security is changing that with its new Active Guard outdoor protection. It's the only home security designed to prevent crimes before they happen. With Active Guard, Simply Safe's 24 7 monitoring agents keep a close watch over your property and actually stop crimes before they happen. 
While other systems only react after a break-in, Simply Safe combines live monitoring and proactive protection both outside and inside your home. Protect your home with 50% off a new Simply Safe system plus a free indoor security camera when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash crooked. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by Little Spoon. Let's talk about something really important that most people don't realize. There are no requirements for baby food companies to test their products for chemical contaminants. What? What? 95% of parents believe the U.S. needs to raise its standards. Yeah, what are we doing? When it comes to baby food safety. Wow, okay, no more arsenic for the kids. (laughs) Little Spoon, the company known for changing the game for baby, toddler, and big kid foods, is disrupting the baby food industry again with radical transparency. Little Spoon is the first and only baby food brand in the U.S. to set strict limits for more than 500 toxins and contaminants based on the best-in-class EU standards. Imagine a little baby CEO. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> little baby disruptor. <laughs> and if their products don't meet these standards, they won't sell it. It's that simple. Peace of mind delivered. America has literally never seen baby food this transparent. Hmm. Literally, Tommy. It's water. I got a bone to pick with our office about Little Spoon. Mm. They sent a bunch of Little Spoon to us here at the office. There were kind of like prepackaged uh, meals that go into the fridge, and there were a ton of snacks. And the people here, these grown-ass adults, just like stole all the snacks. Really? They ate them all. I noticed, that good. I noticed like the little pouches are in our fridge for me yeah. and love it. I'm like, what, what are we doing with the pouches? Are we well, supposed to take them home to our kids? You can snack on them if you want. But yeah, I was going to bring a couple home to Lizette because she loves those little pouches. Teddy's been eating Little Spoon from before they were a sponsor. Oh, yeah. Roshni's super into it. Like, a lot well, of people as soon here, as like, I saw the sponsor, I was like, oh, this is what Teddy eats all yeah, the time. He loves it. Big He's fans obsessed. Here. You can see all of Little Spoon's baby food safety standards in detail and shop their products for babies, toddlers, and big kids on littlespoon.com. Get 30% off your first order. Go to littlespoon.com slash PSA and enter our code PSA at checkout to save 30% off your first order. That's littlespoon.com slash PSA to save 30% off. We're recording this on Monday afternoon, West Coast time, uh, and today alone, Kamala Harris did an event near Philly, uh, a conversation with Liz Cheney, hosted by our pal Sarah Longwell from Bulwark. She's also in the Detroit suburbs and the Milwaukee suburbs. Um, here's a sampling of the message she's driving uh, in those places. This is from uh, her event in Detroit, and that was moderated by uh, Maria Shriver. Madam Vice President, you know, everybody I talk to says, you know, I have to turn off the news. I can't read anything. I'm meditating. I'm doing yoga. I'm doing, I'm so anxious. I just don't even know. I'm eating gummies, all kinds of things, you know. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? How Not do you eating make- gummies. <laughs> well, I've said many times, I do She's believe Donald Trump to be an unserious man. But the consequences of him ever being in the White House again are brutally serious. And, and take it from the people who know him best, his former chief of staff when he was president, two former defense secretaries, his national security advisor, and of course his vice president, who have all in one way or another used the word that he is unfit to be president again and is dangerous. And that illustrates the challenge from the other side. She goes from gummies, <laughs> laughing gummies, to <laughs> he's a dangerous threat. It's so funny that just like, I'm sorry, but like Shriver just talking about what people are doing to deal with their stress just sounded so fucking rich. <laughs> so rich. It's just what it was. Yeah. Um, what'd you got? So the headline in the Times from Monday morning's Pennsylvania event was Cheney with Harris tells anti abortion women it's okay to back her. Just wild times. Um, what's your take on what the strategy was behind uh, these Cheney events? So, I mean, the, there was a Times analysis that talked about who both campaigns think are the persuadable voters left out there. And the Harris campaign thinks about 10 percent of voters in swing states are still winnable. And a big chunk of those voters are Republican women who dislike Trump uh, but need to hear more from her on the border and the economy to close the deal. And these events are laser focused on those women. And they also, I think, generally push back on the Trump criticism of Kamala Harris as like a uh, what's it? She's a Marxist, communist, fascist at this point. You know, whatever he's calling her, some sort of extreme radical. When you see her up there with Maria Shriver or Liz Cheney, I think that really rebuts um, those criticisms in a pretty strong way. I was uh, I was watching the Pennsylvania one, and when Kamala Harris got a question about abortion, she started giving her answer. I was watching Liz Cheney, and I'm like, well, this is awkward because mm-hmm. it's like usually they're just talking about things they agree on. That, um, and then Cheney asked to step in. And then gave that answer on abortion. And it just made me think, you know, there's been some criticism from some corners of the Internet on the left that like, oh, Kamala Harris is out there with the Cheneys and now she's blowing the whole thing. because But like not only has Kamala Harris not moderated 
any positions or given up anything in order to get the support of Liz Cheney. There's Liz Cheney saying, oh, by the way, I'm against abortion, but I'm here because I think this is so important. And by the way, these abortion bans have gone way too far. She was talking about how uh, in Texas, Ken Paxton, the attorney general, is suing to get women's private medical records because he wants to see if they've traveled over state lines to get an abortion. And, and Liz Cheney is like, we can't do this anymore. So I thought it was like, I thought it's really effective. Liz Cheney, I think, is an incredible spokesperson in that setting. It is a rem like she's doing the thing we've been asking everyone to do. And it speaks to both what it clearly took for her to do this and also the cowardice of so many others that she is basically alone up there. But like that was a great event. It's yeah. just a great event. And it's incredibly persuasive. I don't want to see Dick Cheney out there ever, but yes, Liz Cheney is a very good spokesperson. And I don't I think, think he'd be a, useful many places. No, and she's I think she's like shown herself to be a principled person from impeachment until now, and I think people give her the benefit of the doubt yeah. on a lot of the other stuff. And it, again, it just sends the message like, yeah, we don't agree. Yeah, I'm conservative, but like, there's just bigger things at stake right now. Um, I want to talk a little bit more of that New York Times story uh, that Tommy brought up um, about how both campaigns are identifying and thinking about undecided voters. Another group of uh, undecided voters that both the Trump and Harris campaigns are targeting are um, disproportionately younger and less white. Um, and they talk about that in the piece. One example, a 22-year-old in Arizona, they have him in the Times piece, who said he doesn't care who wins and that he only registered to vote because his mom made him. But he will vote for Harris if someone brings a ballot to his front door. I mean, I hope I hope the Harris campaign gets his address. That's why I have a field program. His people. name, his name's in the piece. Give him a call. Find his address. Send him a ballot. How long did the Times interview take, my man? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> you care a little bit. You care enough to spend a, a whole interview talking about it. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a fair point. How much yeah. you don't care? Trump campaign thinks that about five percent of voters yeah. are undecided, and like you said, it's funny because we're going to talk about Pluff's interview in a little bit with John Heilman. But Pluff said there's about four percent, but I think. What you mentioned from the Times piece is the Harris campaign thinks that up to 10% are persuadable. And the reason I think it's bigger is because of those Republican women or right-leaning independent women who um, just do not like Trump but are not yet sold on Harris. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to tell just sort of a, how people slice and dice the numbers between like the group of voters that either won't vote or, or almost certainly would vote for Trump, the group of people that won't vote or almost certainly or probably would vote for Kamala, and then the group of people that are truly going to vote or, or may or may not vote but are actually undecided. Yeah, the Times found that they think that 3.7% of voters in battleground states are undecided, which is only 1.2 million people. So 1.2 million truly undecideds. But I think you're right. These numbers, these percentages swell when you're talking about uh, not voting to voting or, you know, people who might be persuaded to stay home, basically. Uh, anything else you guys found notable in that story? The refrain of how people want more information and then how hard it is to get that that people the readily available information and even that when Kamala Harris does this huge round of press how little it ultimately gets to those voters there's one piece that like 20 times no single program reached more than one in three of those undecided voters there's just like See, I, I was surprised by that the was, other direction yeah so it says it the the, the in the times piece it said internal surveys the uh, Harris campaign internal surveys showed that two-thirds of undecided voters in the battleground states had consumed at least some of Kamala's interviews during her big media blitz week or two weeks mm -hmm. but no single program reached more than one in three of those undecided voters but two-thirds of undecided just seeing something Some, I, that shocked me I, that i just like big daddy gang i guess i just like <laughs> what does it mean for i just like how hard it is like these are all people saying they want more information she's doing a full court press across every kind of media and like maybe maybe one in three is getting some clip of one thing it's just like it just reminds just like the anyway i thought where you were going to go with the more information complaint is uh the woman that they interviewed at the end of the piece she's like a 40 something uh republican woman <laughs> in pennsylvania and she doesn't like trump but she's like worried about the economy and she goes you know i've heard a little bit about kamala harris's plans but on housing she wants to give like first-time home buyers a twenty five thousand dollar credit on their down payment and i just don't want to be given more money and no one's talking about the supply of housing and i was like oh she wants <laughs> to build three million more but well, she also <laughs> said she might write in rfk jr as a protest is that the same woman I <laughs> yeah think? that was the it's, same just... it's <sighs> tough undecided it's voters tough. are and, tough and 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 we love them and we just we love, love them. them and we don't want to say anything other than we love them and i we also, just love their whole energy that they're bringing to this i also found it interesting that of the more than 100 clips during her media blitz that the Harris campaign tested for their effectiveness in increasing her support. Her uh, her proposal uh, about providing home care 
for uh, adding home care coverage to Medicare coverage for seniors ranked at the top, which yep. is interesting because, again, who's going to talk about that on shows like ours? The other <laughs> and cable and everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned it, but like, it's not it's not going to get people get pundits excited, but it, it moves votes. Yeah, it's something people care about. I also thought it was, uh, the Trump campaign found that uh, up for grabs voters were six times more likely than other battleground voters to be motivated by their views of the war in Gaza. They didn't really say in which direction. I found that interesting too, especially since the Harris campaign doesn't seem to see that. I like there. So there was that fact, and then the other point that the, the other the other factor in the Trump campaign is that uh, uh, the undecideds are more likely to work two jobs on average, and they earn fifteen thousand less per household than the mm-hmm. battleground voters who have made up their minds. And I saw those two facts side by side, and I was like, I'm trying to make sense of this. So undecided voters are working two jobs and really struggling, but also more motivated by. Uh, the Middle East than other voters. And I, I wondered if some of that was a little bit of them wish casting. wish casting and kind of putting a little something out there. I think it's also who the the pool is that you're talking about. If these voters are younger, um, you're just going to get more of them that care yeah. about Gaza than older voters, I think. Yeah. The, the other sort of last thing I noticed on this was um, they talked about how Kamala Harris bought ads on daytime Fox because more women are watching Fox uh, during the day than at night when it's more opinion focused. I thought that was and then the Washington Post had a bunch of swing state polls out today where they asked people about their main news sources. And they found that about a quarter of those who consider Fox a main source of news said they're considering voting for Kamala Harris with about one in six saying they have already or definitely plan to vote for her. Which is just a very surprising fact, I thought. I Well, on the last pod we did, I can't remember when, with Dan, I had looked at the New York Times, the latest New York Times poll, and that showed that uh, 10% of undecided voters say that Fox was a, a news source for them. Yeah, but then uh, I wonder, like, okay, so then the kind of person answering these polls is the kind of person consuming this news. And I don't know. It made me think, like, well, does that tell you more about the poll than it does about mm. the voters? Mm. Uh, well, we also got more insight into how the Harris campaign is thinking about this extremely close race uh, from David Pluff in a new interview with Puck's John Heilman. Uh, here's some of that. This race is just dead even. And listen, I, you know, I think the Trump campaign uh, would admit that, too. And you can tell based on their activity and what they're saying. I guess my confidence is more based on looking at who the undecided voters are. Um, and, you know, data these days is incredibly rich and sophisticated. Every battleground state of the seven, there's at least 4% who are still trying to decide who to vote for. And the early voting data we're seeing so far, there's no suggestion that they are turning out a bunch of irregular voters. Does your data in the seven battleground states show any sign that Trump has momentum and that he's tight? Whether you say, I get that, that, that it's uh, mathematically, statistically, this is going to be a toss-up race within the margin of error in all seven. But you could see it, there is momentum in, that's coming through in your data that's not noise. Does the Trump campaign have any of that in any of the seven battleground states? No. I would listen to an interview with David Pluff. Maybe he should just give like a five minutes every night yeah. from now until if it, in, uh, the next two weeks. Wouldn't that be nice? For sure. Because it's not like I, – I call this pre- – it's prestige hopium. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not like everything's going to be fine kind of thing, but it is because because at the end, he's still like, yeah, we could lose this race. It's very close. It's tied. Right. But it is it's just a lot of great insight from Pluff. I, I highly recommend you listen to it. And Pluff, if you have any more stuff to say, just come, come back on. Back. Pod Save America. Yeah, we'll do that five minutes here or the call map, by the way. The, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, it, it's also like there's a point the point of the interview where Heilman asked him, like, what what do you say to people looking at the. The swinging of the 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 Nate Silver average, and he's like, I don't, I wouldn't look at that. I don't look at that. And it's just well, like, yeah, well, don't, said it's don't, based on public polls. Yeah, yeah, they just don't look. He won't look at any public polls because he thinks they're junk. But that, but it just there that like that they're based on public polls. And if the Nate Silver model says it's fifty two forty eight versus forty eight fifty two, it still means that forty eight times out of a hundred Kamala wins, or forty out of time forty eight times out of a hundred Trump wins. Like these little changes don't matter. And it was like what Pluff said to Dan. A couple days ago, very similar to what he's saying here, which is basically like these ebbs and flows in the public polling that are causing these like epic swings and vibe shift and text to me are like, <laughs> they're just not real. They're just not real. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the another important point he made was that Trump is just so dependent on turning out these first time or irregular voters. Uh, and that's a real risk. And he, he repeated his observation that they're not seeing incels marauding to early vote locations. So that was good to hear. And again, we talk a lot about how Democrats are struggling 
to uh, win over male voters. But Plouffe talked about Trump's massive disadvantage when it comes to the women, especially college educated women and women under 29. And then again, for all the talk about shifts in the Latino vote, he made the point that a lot of the numbers are coming from these national polls where you're sampling like 300, 400 total people. Uh, and, you know, there are going to be states like Florida where Trump is going to win overwhelmingly and is going to win with Latino voters. And that's going to skew what sort of the aggregate picture looks like. But really, the Harris campaign is concerned about Arizona, Nevada and parts of Pennsylvania. Yeah. I also thought just in general, he said, look, Trump's going to get 48, 48.5% of the vote. And that's probably higher than he got even in 2020. He's like, and that's just a fact that we're all going to have to live with. And he thinks that any tightening that we have seen in the polls lately is just polls that had Trump at 43, 44, 45. And then finally he's getting his vote share, which he's going to end up getting. And she's, you know, sitting at 49 uh, in a lot of these. And so I think when, you know, he keeps, he has said before to Dan too, 48, 48 or 48, 47 in like all these swing states. And he said that the reason that he has confidence that he's cautiously confident, is what he said, is that the he thinks that they have a higher ceiling, that Kamala Harris has a higher ceiling than Trump does, and that the remaining voters who are undecided look more like Harris voters than Trump voters. Um, but that said, they still have to get those voters out. They still have some persuasion to do. And he also said that he thinks door knocking and, and canvassing and like going out there is going to be more important this year, this election, than it has been almost any other election. Yeah, and, and partly because the campaign started later, there are people that truly are undecided and want more information, and it may be somebody coming to their door to give it to them. Like that like that kid in Arizona who needs the ballot dropped <laughs> off at his door. Uh, how are you guys feeling? Terrible. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel great. I just I, want it to be over. I, just, I went into the CVS and I got a two-for-one uh, Pepsid so that I could have <laughs> one in my house and one in my car. Which is, I think, maybe just being forty-two. I think that I think if we were up by five, I still probably would need it. Yeah, but probably. I can't be sure. I, think I can't would. be sure. I feel fairly zen. Um, you know, I was a little angsty over the weekend. I did go to a children's birthday party and was talking to one of the parents. And of course, you have to, you know, you, you do the pod wherever you go. And uh, and I was I was giving what I thought was just a fr- pretty, not optimistic or pessimistic, neutral analysis of where the race stands. And I finished up, and then she walked back up to me ten seconds later. And she goes. You made me feel awful. This is scary. I'm like, yeah, it, we can lose. Like, it's not. No one should think that. I think there was. I think there were some. A lot of good feelings, as there should have been, um, after the switch, after the convention, after the debate. I know that I thought that there was a possibility if she did well in the debate, maybe she'd open a little bit of lead that would be stable, and that would be that. It's just. It's going to be a tied race. What feels bad is that this piece of shit is even in the running. Yes, of course. And that yes. will never not be the case. Yep, that's right. And, and, but it's also like I, I just don't want us to do the same thing we've done did in 2016. Like. Who gives a shit how you feel over the next two weeks? I'm sorry, Maria Shriver. Yeah, it doesn't for fucking matter. No, but it doesn't matter how. No, thank you for, and thank you for asking. We should check in with <laughs> people you question. love. Thank you for but the like, question. But like, like, oh, what are you doing to deal with all the stress? The stress over the next two weeks. Who cares? Well, I was who gonna, fucking cares? And I know, and I know, you did what you guys have done yeah. this too, and you felt the same thing. Like I ended up doing um, a kickoff call for the uh, uh, Wisconsin Democrats, their organizers, the whole staff uh, Sunday night, and after a weekend of feeling a little angsty about everything. I finished that call and I heard all the stories about the doors they knocked on and the voters they talked to the people. And I was just listening. I was just like listening on the call after I like talked to them for a couple of minutes and I, I stayed on for the whole half hour. And I'm like, this, I walked out of that call. I'm like, this was better than any good poll. I just felt, I felt so great. Now, is that feeling uh, <laughs> valid because it's all anecdotal? Who knows? Maybe not. But it, it felt good. Well, that was a point that like you'll hear with shots where he was talking about that moment where Kamala says, oh, you're at the wrong rally. You're looking for the smaller one down the street. And yeah. he said that like, like when he was first running, there was no poll. He's running a state legislator race in Hawaii. And that like you did matter. The vibes did matter. They mattered both because they represented how things would go, mm. but also vibes will help you get things to where you need them to go and so like a lot less angsting like uh, are we going to be okay text it is not known it will not be known until a few days after the election everybody's just gonna go to vote save america and do the shift you haven't done yet well who needs polls though when we uh now have actual (sighs) votes coming in that we can analyze before they've even been counted um that's right more than 15 million people have already voted early which means tea leaves are being read and lessons are not being learned uh (laughs) And either of you guys want to remind folks what the early vote can and can't tell us? 
yeah, it can't tell us anything. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it can't tell you anything because this early voting, it has gone 2020, 2022, 2024. Each of these elections, like the the pandemic, post pandemic, the rise of vote by mail and early voting, a Republican candidate who has just has come out against vote by mail and, and tried to push people towards Election Day. Like the influence of all of this means we just don't know what the vote share will be on Election Day and an election that will be decided by a point or two. If we're lucky, that will really matter. And so the margins are what matters. And there's no way to know the margins. Like maybe there's value to it for a campaign and very specific kind of targeting and information. But for us out here in the world, not particularly useful. Yeah, unless you're doing very sophisticated like regression analysis based on blah 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 math math, like don't read this stuff. Yeah, it's useless. Yeah, so everyone knows because you know we heard Pluff talking about um, the they feel good about the incels not showing up at the polls. Well, you might be vote, thinking like because the ballots aren't coming in sticky. <laughs> so, wow, this is a re- setting a real record on this yeah, episode. Good episode. Good episode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what what they what the early vote can tell you, and again, it can really tell campaigns this who are who have so much sophisticated data and are calling thousands of people a night and ground game and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they can tell you party, demographic information, vote history. I think that's what Pluff's referring to. So in some states, you know if the voter who's voted early has voted a lot before or are one of those low propensity voters. And then you can see if the low propensity voter looks like a Harris voter or looks like a Trump voter. So you can make some educated guesses if you're the campaign. And that only helps you insofar as not knowing if you're going to win, but knowing, OK, we've got these voters, but we still need to go after these voters because they haven't early voted yet. And so now we need to go make sure that they send their ballots. in. Like that's what early vote is good for in a campaign. It's not good for telling you like, oh yeah, now we're going to win. Because even if you ask a campaign with sophisticated data analysis about what the early vote trend, they'll say, well, we're a little down, but hopefully on election day, everything, you know, we're going to chase all those ballots that didn't come in yet. That's what they'll say. And by the way, that's not like a false or, or that's not a, that's not necessarily a false hope, right? Like there have been elections where the early vote, people took that to predict a democratic lean that wasn't there. There times where I used to predict a a Republican lean that wasn't there. Like it's just, it's not been predictive. There were people in 2016 uh, looking at the early vote predicting landslide Hillary Clinton victories, and they could not have possibly been more wrong. So yeah. Let's just not make that mistake again. And, 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 you know, because, again, the behavior, the voting behavior has changed so much that even in, I remember in 2022, the early vote was sort of bad for Democrats, mm-hmm. quote unquote bad, compared to 2020, because everyone was using the 2020 comparison. And it turned out that was all wrong because people's behavior started changing. We will find out Just after the election what we learned about early vote and what we learned about the polling this cycle. But there's really- And then very, we will take those lessons and, and for next election them. day and afterwards- And over-apply them. We will, we will fight right the last the war shall yet fight again. the last war. There's Kamala to the incels. Do not come. <laughs> that's Do not, not come. that's for the vol cells. Do not come. Oh God. You can yes and a joke once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's some funny shit. <laughs> Okay, when we come back from the break, uh, Lovett's going to talk with Senator Brian Schatz about the latest with the key Senate races we and have a the Senator presidential. On this episode. <laughs> Schatz is like, how did it? Well, how that's did this happen throat. to me? That's the throat of Schatz is me doing that. Yeah, I'm that's sorry. it. Nice. Uh, anyway, but you but- know who is coming on the pod? It's Senator Brian Schatz. <laughs> is that what you want, Tommy? I'm going to add to your little joke. Okay. <laughs> your, I like your that. Little, <laughs> your little joke. See? See? Oh, okay. oh you can tell I a know. little joke, too. I know. He, oh, oh, my God. Maybe you can make we're us a little scorecard. We're already in the, we're <laughs> already in the ads. Uh, anyway, yeah, we have two two quick announcements. Uh, first, the, enti- the entire season of Empire City, the untold origin story of the NYPD, is finally out. The series that was named one of Vulture's best podcasts of 2024 takes listeners through pivotal moments in the NYPD's history that shape modern policing, including how the police got militarized, what happened when New York City cops started policing abortion, and the first ever investigation into police corruption. You can binge all episodes now by following Empire City wherever you get your podcasts and enjoy ad-free listening by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Also, you don't need us to tell you this, but the most effective messengers in these final days are not people like us. What? Mm-hmm. They're people like you. Oh. Uh, that's why we've launched what we're calling Last Call. Last Call. Last Call. We need everyone listening. That means you. If you're listening, we're talking to you. Uh, to think of three people you know in swing states. Okay? Three people you know. Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, or Georgia. Friend, former colleague, a one-time hookup, 
Uh, a a friend of me. An acquaintance. Yeah. The love of your life who moved away. You broke your heart. Yeah, the one that got away. Here's the ask. Scroll through your contacts list, find those names, and text or call them or message them. Do whatever you have to do. Uh, then do that five more times before Election Day. Uh, reminders work. Ask them if they have a plan to vote. You can send them to Vote Save America. They can look at their ballots. They can figure out the, to make a plan to vote. Um, and if you don't know anyone in those states, which, fuck you, coastal elite, uh, you definitely know three people who could use a nudge to vote no matter yeah. where they live. Then, and that's yeah. important too, you know? And if and if and and for one lucky person who does it, we're giving you a million dollars. That is... The for the right person, a million dollars. That is not true. That's not true. There's folks. a million dollars in it. That is parody. for one lucky person. That is parody. One million dollars. Wow, what a what a contest. Your move, FEC. Uh, <laughs> again, if you don't know what to say in those texts, DMs, and calls, go to votesaveamerica.com slash vote where you can sign up to get scripts that you can put in your own words to send to your friends, maybe even written by John Lovett. Just go to votesaveamerica.com slash vote and click get the script to get started. This message has been paid for by Vote Save America. You can learn more at votesaveamerica.com. This ad has not been authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. When we come back, Brian Schatz. Last call. Nice. He's saying who wants shots? That works perfectly. Yay. Pod Save America is brought to you by Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol. If there's a surefire way to wake up feeling fresh after a night of drinking, it's with pre-alcohol. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. And with their GMO technology, Zbiotics is continuing to invent probiotics that will help with the everyday challenges of modern living. Love, love Zbiotics. If you're over 30 and you have a couple drinks and you're not taking a Zbiotics first, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're making your life Especially worse. Especially if you're listening to this no and we're reason. telling you. And it's 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 affordable. It comes to your house. You can get a subscription as I do. I'm a subscriber. And yeah, I often every buy month. over the top of that. <laughs> <laughs> Same. It is it is it works really, really well. Go to zbiotics.com slash crooked to learn more and get fifteen percent off your first order when you use Crooked at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash crooked and use the code crooked at checkout for 15% off. Joining us today, friend of the show from the great state of Hawaii, Senator Brian Schatz, welcome back to the pod. Nice to be back here, John. Good to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you too, Senator Schatz. I just want you to know I'm I'm, ap- I'm now losing it. So this is going to be, let's see what happens. I, I, the anxiety is through the roof. The Prilosec's not working. I'm having fever dream. I'm having stress dreams. Uh, so we have two weeks left. People are voting. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about the state of the race here? Uh, look, I I have to say it. I'll say it this way. Um, we are slightly ahead. And if we do everything we're supposed to do, we will win. And if we do anything we're not supposed to do, we will not. Um, so <laughs> I like our chances but that, it, but we really do have to execute in the next couple of weeks. Now, Kamala, the good news, right, is that our candidate is executing at a super, super high level. And that's not just important from the standpoint of vote getting. It also gives a lot of confidence to the grassroots out there, the people who are giving money, the people who are knocking on doors. When you see your candidate kicking ass, you kind of want to, you know, follow that example. So I think it's, uh, it's as important that she sort of lead us um, that that as it is that she sort of demonstrate that she's the right person to be uh, the next president of the United States. So I'm feeling pretty confident, but definitely not overconfident. And, you know, as there's an old a line in an old movie. I don't trust happiness. So I'm going to be scared all the way through. Yeah, that's um, sounds Jewish. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what we what we need to do. I was talking about this with Tim Miller and he used a sports analogy, which is it's now about. Uh, it's now about the 12th man. It's now about the crowd uh, and what the crowd can do. Um, uh, but, on this, but, but on the other hand, you know, we have to do everything right and we can't do everything, anything wrong in order to win. Why does that logic not apply to Donald Trump? 
Well, listen, I don't know. Uh, and maybe it does, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe some of these hiccups, maybe the fact that he's starting to turn down uh, media opportunities, maybe, maybe the uh, fact that he's not even campaigning in swing states, but going to California, New York, like all of that could end up being, in retrospect, the reason he loses. All we can control, though, is what we're up to. And we have to execute as well as we possibly can because of the Electoral College. Um, if this were a popular vote thing, I think I'd feel a little more confident. But I do feel confident. And it's a weird thing, right? The polling is fine, but not, you know, dispositive. But I will tell you, last night, um, when when the vice president was interrupted by some hecklers and she said, oh, no, you must be you must be at the wrong rally. There's a smaller one down the street. It was such a small thing. And yet it was such a big thing. You only do that if you have a spring in your step. Yeah. And I have very look, I you know, I started in politics in, in state legislative races where we had no money for polling. And so it was a lot about body language and organization and kind of the vibes on the ground. And we could predict with some uh, regularity, with some confidence, who was going to win without any polling. And so I would say if you took all the polling out of it, um, Kamala Harris is kicking ass and Donald Trump is melting down. Um, And then if you put the polling into it, it's damn close. I love that. I love a vibes based analysis. Uh, Let's talk about Trump. So we've got. I think two stories right now. One is Mad King. He's bouncing and swaying to the music. He's rambling, seeming confused. He's canceling interviews and events. The Harris Walls campaign is asking on social, are you okay? And then we've got the two-bit authoritarian. He's starting to deploy the military, handle his enemies, promising mass deportations, threatening democracy. How are you putting those two stories together right now? Well, I don't think it's that hard. I mean, I think the the, the problem with um, characterizing him as a threat to democracy is that you're sort of inherently giving him a ton of power, um, power over our collective psyches, power over the American experiment. And then he seems strong. And so I think what the Harris campaign has done and it sort of unlocked, even in a way that the Biden, the successful Biden campaign um, did not, was this idea that sure, he is a threat, but he's also a joke. Yeah. And if you look through history, lots of people who did lots of bad things were also ridiculous figures in 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 human um, uh, history. And so he's both of those things. He's a legitimate threat to uh, the American way of life. And he's also a jackass. And um, one of the things that I think Kamala is doing well, and one of the reasons that we were doing poorly um, with Biden, frankly, as our standard bearer, is there's just at least some portion of the electorate that wants someone who um, who's on the ball, who looks like they're kind of like smacking the other side around. And they're not really sure what they think about the issues, but they want someone who looks like a good television president, right? Like someone who looks like they're kicking ass. And Kamala Harris looks like she's kicking ass. And whatever Donald Trump's like, um, you know, personal flaws and policy flaws and, 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 and his sort of, sort of almost evil uh, way of viewing the American experiment, he had some game back in the day. Yeah. Like he could actually be fun to watch, interesting to watch, infuriating to watch, but like good television. This is not good television anymore. And I think that there is something uh, pretty significant about Kamala pointing that out. It's, of course, not the main thing. But remember, people vote for your side for their reasons, not yours. We are not looking to get vindicated here. We're just looking for the W. Yeah, it's funny as you say that. I hadn't thought about that way because I remember early in like 2017, 2018, I would say like, hey, everybody, we got to like accept like Trump has some charm here. He has some charisma. He can be funny. And people really they did not care for it. But it it reminds me, have you seen these videos going around of Frankie Valley being uh, brought out to the microphones to lip sync his old hits? No. There's a little bit of a no. Frankie Valley energy uh, to it where he. I actually had thought about it that way, that he really is kind of he's he's trying to do the performance he used to do. And it's not it isn't working. It isn't working. Listen, when I so, you know, I grew up in Hawaii and we used to go. You guys call it karaoke. We call it karaoke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would always sing, you know, just once by James Ingram. It was a blast. I was 16 years old. Then I was 26 years old. And there was some point at which. You know, I'm in my 30s. I'm singing just once. By is it fun anymore? Is it charming anymore? Is it hilarious anymore? I feel like uh, he's sort of the last guy at the karaoke bar, you know, and he won't let go of the microphone. You know that that story is it's it's I think it's in, it's helpful. It's a good analogy. It does make me sad. 
I think you could keep doing karaoke. I don't think you need to stop. I don't I don't think you can age out of it. And I think that you should let that go. That's that's something that's projection. I listen, I'm not saying that I shouldn't sing. I'm just saying I should maybe pick a new song. Yeah, no, okay, pick a new song. Pick a new song. So uh it's a close race. You'd rather be us than them, but Trump could win. And based on what you're seeing right now, and only to point us to places where we have to work harder, close some gaps. If Trump ekes it out, how did he do it? How did he put together the coalition? What are we missing? I still think we need more actual human beings uh, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Uh, And we need more money in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Ohio for Sherrod Brown. You know, look, it is it is fair to say that some of these uh, races, you know, the die is cast, the money is spent and the voters, you know, it's basically up to the voters now. But there are a couple of places where it's close enough and the turnout operations matter enough and they are sophisticated enough where you could take a person from, you know, who lives in Santa Monica or lives in, you know, South Texas and just wants to help. And they get on that online phone banking thing and they actually make a difference. So I, I would still help in the Midwest. Um, both by sending money and by either showing up physically or making phone calls. So Trump has been uh, pulling him, pulling out of events. It's clear his campaign is trying to take him out of these sort of more national platforms, whether it's an NBC interview, a CNBC interview, 60 Minutes. Uh, and they're just sort of, I think, resigned to what he's going to do at the rallies. Meanwhile, my, your th- the thought might be, OK, so they're letting his, letting his freak flag fly in these debates that are mo- mostly reaching his supporters. They're they're counting on the media not covering it really that effectively or kind of sane washing him or people not really seeing what he's saying at these rallies. But they're going to make up for it with ads that are more mainstream. And yet in Pennsylvania, they're running millions upon millions of dollars of ads uh, uh, demonizing trans people as opposed to uh, inflation or the economy or what have you. Can you make sense of it at all? Is there any theory to it that that we might look back on and say, oh, that that actually was smarter than it looked? No, it's not smarter than it looks. It, they tried it uh, the last couple of uh, cycles. It doesn't work. It is their happy place ideologically, and it is where they go where they when they don't have anything to run on. Look, they want to be closing with an inflation message, right? Uh, they want to be closing with an economic message. But Kamala Harris and the Democrats and Bob Casey and Sherrod Brown and John Tester and Tammy Baldwin and everybody else have basically erased the Republicans lead on the economy. And so they just sort of like dig in. You know, it used to be the uh, the caravans. And because the because, first of all, border crossings are at a not an all time low, but at a, at a low over the last several years. And the Republicans killed the border security bill. They don't have that one. They don't have inflation. And so they're just kind of like digging around in their. In, the, in their trunk trying to find something. And this is their sort of ideological safe space. There's no evidence that this moves uh, swing voters. And I think Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris and everybody else is handling it well, which is to, you know, stand for equality, but not to dwell on it. Because frankly, the, what people find offensive about that, uh, regular folks, is like, why are you even talking about that? Like, that has nothing to do with my life. Trump is doing a fair amount of a certain kind of press, which is interviews with podcasters and influencers in the kind of loosely part of the manosphere, uh, trying to reach these lower propensity, less political men. Um, A, do you worry about it? And then B, should Kamala Harris go on Joe Rogan? (laughs) Um, Sure. Listen, I worry about everything. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think this is like the, the winning strategy. I think the winning strategy would be for him to, you know, wake up more, one morning and pretend to be a moderate and, you know, say nice things about democracy. Um, that that would worry me. Whether this will work or not, I have no idea. Yeah, I think she should go on Joe Rogan. Hell yeah, me too. I know people who listen to Joe Rogan. I think she can handle Joe Rogan. Yeah. I think as I've, you know, and I've watched clips, I haven't listened to like a whole Joe Rogan podcast because I, I can't set aside two and a half hours necessarily. But um one of the things that I think is true about Joe Rogan is that he's kind of impressionable and likes to be kind to his guests. And I just don't imagine that he's going to come in like loaded for bear. I'm sure he'll have some prepped questions, but in a sort of political discussion between Kamala Harris and Joe Rogan, I, I do think Kamala, you know, wins the exchange. Now, does that end up in, you know, a bunch of clippable memes that, 
you know, are designed to make her look bad. Sure. But I still think, you know, they're going to do that anyway. They're, those memes are going to be um, created anyway. And I just think she looks strong. She looks unafraid. And um, and I think one of the other things that, you know, I got a couple of buddies who, you know, have difficulty with Kamala, but not for any real reason other than they have been sort of poisoned uh, by um, by the Internet. And so sometimes you just have to break through that palace guard and talk to people directly. So, but like, do I think the whole campaign is going to hinge on going on Joe Rogan? I do not. I just think she should basically find whatever audience she can find. And I think what the cool thing about their campaign is I think they've figured out both like probably statistically speaking, because they have real data operations and intuitively that basically wherever she goes, she and she presents, she ends up slightly more popular than when she came in. And yeah. so my view is if that's true, then Joe Rogan's got 12 million people and you should talk to him. Yeah, more more, more Kamala is more and more Trump is less. Brett Baer, she went, she did it. I think there were good moments and there's moments they're exploiting. Whether you call it a big win, a medium win, a draw, whatever you want to say about it, it's not going to get tougher than that. It's not going to get harder than no. that. The combination of of questions designed to go for biggest vulnerabilities, the interrupting all of it was like, I think, as tough an interview as she could possibly have. Uh, so uh, any logic for that interview to me says, like, go, go there. Like, just like, fuck it. Um, let's talk about the Senate. Uh, your colleague from Texas, John Cornyn, is leading candidate to succeed Mitch McConnell, whether in majority or minority, vowed to block nominees for Kamala Harris he deems too far left. He said, I'm not going to schedule a vote on some wild eyed radical nominee. So if Kamala Harris wins and the Senate flips, will Kamala, would Kamala Harris be able to replace a Supreme Court justice or even have a cabinet? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and that's why I, mean, I really don't. And I, you know, I don't like the hypotheticals just because I don't even like to stipulate either a win or a loss yeah. on either side. But I but I do think it illustrates how important it is uh, for us to focus on these Senate races like there. There is no um, path to a Kamala Harris cabinet or to a rebalancing of the Supreme Court, or to climate action, or to codifying Roe, um, or to codifying LGBTQ rights, or any economic progress um, without a Democratic Senate. And I just don't want anybody to get sort of despondent here. We were here two years ago and four years ago, and it was predicted by all the smart people that we were going to lose the Senate. And then we kept the Senate and then we kept the Senate again. And we've passed the biggest climate action in human history and we reduced the price of prescription medicine. And we've done all these incredible things only because we won the Senate. And so, yes, the presidency is job one. But, you know, job one A is making sure Sherrod Brown and John Tester and Tammy Baldwin and Alyssa Slotkin and, and Bob Casey return to the Senate. Talk to me about Nebraska, Texas, Florida. I'm not going to talk about Nebraska at all. I um, I don't know very much about it, and okay. I, I don't want that to you know polarize. I, what I would say about Texas is that, you know, Beto got very, very close, and I think Colin Allred is running a slightly more disciplined campaign um, and a very well-funded campaign. Um, you know, he's very close and does need money. Um, and I think the theory of the case in Florida is – basically the same except that we have um, reproductive choice on the ballot. And so in a scenario where the turnout projections are slightly undercounting the number of pro-choice individuals showing up, um, then I think um, we could either win Florida on the presidential or lose by a little. And then Debbie Mukarso Powell um, can win. Um, she's running an extraordinary campaign. But both of those campaigns are campaigns that actually need uh, hard money cash. So if you've got 500 bucks laying around, send the campaign, not some campaign committee, not some super PAC, send the campaign some money and they will put it right into communicating with voters. Uh, so I really enjoy that. Nebraska's not happening. Sorry, I even raised it. Forgot it. Forget about it. Huge mistake on my yeah. part. Forget Nebraska. We don't even know what's going on there. What's, it's not even, it really has nothing to do with us, frankly. Uh, Correct. So interesting about Nevada, Arizona, and Florida. These are states with uh, competitive Senate races. They are states that uh, Florida's tougher, but but where uh, uh, traditionally we've considered them swing states uh, in the presidential and their states with abortion ballot measures. 
two theories here. One is the abortion ballot measures turn out people that care about basic reproductive freedom. The other place like Arizona, you have voters who are going to vote for Ruben Gallego. They're going to vote to protect abortion. And then they are considering whether or not to vote for an anti-choice, anti-abortion president under the feeling that they're balancing, that they're protecting abortion in Arizona anyway. How do you deal with that kind of false sense of comfort? Well, I think the, the the Harris campaign has done a pretty effective job in making it clear that Donald Trump really is going to push for a national abortion ban. And so it won't matter what kind of statutory protections you have at a state by state level. And the problem is when they talk about national uh, minimum national standards, they mean a federal abortion ban. And Donald Trump is going to do that. There's no doubt about it. That is part of Project 2025. I think we've done a very good job of getting the word out and making it clear that you sort of can't have your cake and eat it too and vote for an anti-choice federal candidate and a pro-choice uh, ballot amendment. But the problem is that even if that uh, is something that has gotten through for, say, 80 percent of the voters, we kind of need it to get through to 95 percent of the voters in order for us to fully align and have uh, the abortion rights uh, uh, referendum in, in Arizona win, Gallego win and Harris win. So I'm losing my mind. You surf. Should I be surfing? Yeah, you should. Sure. Of course. Uh, Southern California. Mm. Wow. It's a lot of ballots, huh? Yeah. I mean, but you're young. You'll be fine. And, you know, you you, you did a reality show that required all kinds of fitness. And you'll be fine. Never got but to use it. Never got even to, Cal- never, I have, my balance is actually really good. Never got to fucking use it. Oh, well, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't watch it, as you know. No, um, I know. Yeah, you should, you should surf. <laughs> but the problem with Southern California surfing is like part of... Part of what's good about surfing, like fishing, like hiking, like lots of things, is that you kind of can escape the hustle and bustle. Southern California surfing is like as stressful as driving on the on the freeways because it's just packed and a little bit uh, aggressive. So, th- you know, th- those are not my vibes. Honestly, just like using stereotypes about my culture to just putting them together. Oh, we're all sitting in traffic here in California. Uh, you and Chris Murphy, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, you seem close. Have your hands ever brushed in a weird way? Chris Murphy and I? No, we don't. he's very Northeastern. There's no touching. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. That's interesting. Uh, so uh, home stretch. just let's reiterate what you feel like people need to do. You want people to go to Pennsylvania. You get, we got to get calls in and feet on the ground in Pennsylvania. We need money in Ohio, Florida, Texas, Wisconsin, and we need calls and volunteers in Wisconsin. It, what else is the other other priorities for you right now? That's it. I mean, I the, the other thing I would say is like, don't agonize, organize. I do think that, um, you know, we're a party that tends to agonize uh, too much. We're a party that doesn't trust happiness. And we're a party that can sometimes talk ourselves out of having the winning momentum. Now, Kamala Harris has done a lot to give us a spring in our step. And it is our obligation, seriously, it is our obligation to stuff our phone in a sock drawer and go out there and campaign. Do it, people. You know, we know this show is very popular. So I know how many people are listening. And I know how many people have signed up at Vote Save America. And I don't like the ratio center shots. A lot of people listening to this that haven't done a goddamn thing. Well, I'm not going to scold anybody except to say that here, here's what I would say. Look, I, um, my first race 26 years ago, I was running for the state house and I came, came out of the primary election kind of bruised. I didn't look super strong. And, um, a mentor of mine said, let's assume you're, uh, behind by about a thousand votes and you've got 90 days left. So you got to win over something like 12 people a day. And let's assume you win over one in four people that you talk to. You're not winning over everybody. Okay, you got to go talk to about 50 humans every day for the next 90 days, and then you're going to win this thing. And that's what I did. I actually knocked on doors to the point where people told me to stop calling and coming by. I wore my shoes out to the point where I had to buy a new pair of rock ports from the local Ross on Ward Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I won by 425 votes. And I would not have won by 425 votes If I stared at a screen wondering if I was going to win by 425 votes, what happens next depends on us. It does not depend on events far away. It depends on what we all do, what all of the listeners do. So if you haven't sort of taken the step to either press the donate button 
or to get on the phone and start calling uh, family and friends or a list provided by the campaign, now's the time. Now's the time. What a great message to end on. And I just also want to say, wherever you are, e- even if you cannot physically get to Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, or any of these other swing states, uh, you can call into those states, you can donate into those states, and I guarantee you, wherever you are, you are within 90 minutes of a house race that could swing the balance in the house, and you can go knock on doors there. John, Tommy, and I begin hitting some of the doors in California as well. So go to votesaveamerica.com. The time, it's it. We're at the two-week mark here, people. Uh, phones down, knocking fist up, you know? Senator Brian Schatz, always, always so good to see you. It's good to see you too, John. I'll look forward to watching Survivor for the first time. That's great. Maybe something something we can do after we win. <laughs> okay, take care. That's our show for today. Wow, what a show. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Dan and guest host Alex Wagner of MSNBC Primetime Fame. We'll be back with a new show on Wednesday. Bye, everyone. Wonder whose dick they'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs>